What's going on guys? We are back out in the shop and we have kind of a continuation project here. So this is the roller skid that we've worked on. So we built the skid underneath. This was a design that their engineers came up with. We built it how they wanted it. This whole roller skid project, it's all kind of a trial and error thing. So they'll have me build something and then they'll try it and if they don't like it then they change the design and then they have me modify it so there's there's a lot of things that are going on with this roller skid thing so they've ran this skid like this for a while and there's a few things they don't like they don't like where the fork pockets are on this one again I welded them on where the engineer wanted them welded on according to the spec according to the drawing so I'm not really sure why they don't like them where they're at but they want them moved from 24 inches to 19 inches on center so what we're gonna do is we're gonna lift this up we're gonna hurry and tear the outside rollers off because the other thing they want done is they want this cut as close to the edge of the rollers as possible so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna lift it up the forklift I'm gonna take a sharpie and I'm gonna draw a line down the edge of that on both sides then I'm gonna tear the outside rollers off and I'm gonna go ahead and take the plasma cut those off then I'm gonna flip it over and I'm gonna to have to scarf those fork pockets off and move them in it kind of this is one of those projects that kind of feels monotonous because you're working on the same things and you'll weld it on and then they don't like it so you move it but hey they're paying me to do it so I really don't care they're pretty good to deal with everything is really good that way they just want the work done quickly and they want it to look good and they want it to work efficiently for what they're trying to do so it works out good for us so we're gonna go ahead and see what we can't get done I don't have a whole lot of time tonight because I've got some daddy duties so I'm gonna go ahead and lift this up get cranking on it so we'll go to that point <laughs> Okay, got the rollers off. I'm gonna be honest, that was a royal pain in the goodness. I had to pull the middle section out first so that I could get to the bolts on the outside sections. Every hole's tap, and those bolts are so tight against the rollers, you can't fit a box end wrench on, you can't fit a impact socket on until until they're loose to where you can push them over to the side and then you can just barely get the socket on but you can't you can't use this because as the bolt backs out it wedges itself inside that C channel so anyway it was just a dang good time I thoroughly enjoyed it so now that that's done we're gonna go ahead set up our angle and hurry and cut these pieces off the sides 
And I'm gonna move my tools so I don't burn them up. We got this all flipped over and as much as I don't want to I think I'm gonna have to zip disc these welds just because we don't want to put any more heat in this than we need to and I'm gonna be able to zip these off pretty quick these stitch welds that's not gonna be too bad I don't think I probably shouldn't have put that much weld on the end of those but I didn't really think I was going to be cutting it apart either. So we'll cut here and then on the other end and we'll go ahead and zip these stitches off. Hopefully it won't be too bad. I already know that it warped a little bit when I stitch welded them on. That's why they had to shim the rollers, which there was really no way around that, especially with 3 8 plate and as heavy as the fork pockets are. It just kind of comes with the territory. But anyway, to avoid putting more heat into it, I can't scarf them off with the plasma. I don't want to use a scarfing tip with a torch. I'm going to zip them off, clean the weld off, scoot them in, and then re-weld them. Only when I weld them on this time, I'm not going to use as big a stitches on the end. I'm not going to weld this. I'm not going to weld it solid on the end here. I'll probably just put a little stitch there in the middle. Not that I think I'm gonna have to cut it apart again, but you never know. It'll be that much less heat put into it too, so that's the plan. So I won't make you guys sit through the zip disc process. Honestly, I don't much care for it myself, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut these off and we'll go from there. I'm not sure at what point the camera died, but we got our plate all cleaned up, rounded our corners again, got our plasma cut edge cleaned up. And if you look, I always try to have a goal to not scar the base material when I'm using the zip disc. Sometimes there's just no way around it, but you can see I did a little bit there. 
but I try to not touch it just like that on some of these you can see I've nicked it a little bit a little nick there but for the most part that that turned out pretty smooth so I got that cleaned up to where there's not big gouges in the base material I am still gonna have to clean up these old welds I'll have to hit those with a grinder that shouldn't take too long and then I'll scoot them in I'll clean the plate off lay it out and then I'll get them stitch welded back on but it's getting pretty late tonight honestly that was kind of my goal for tonight so we got the plate cleaned up we didn't get it hot at all I feel pretty good about that so we'll see if we can't continue and get this one knocked out tomorrow so we'll see you guys tomorrow night it's time for today's super cool tool Alright guys, so for today for the super cool tool, we're going to talk about something that's probably not the most exciting tool to talk about, but it is an extremely useful tool, and in my opinion, it is a necessity when it comes to welding and fabrication. And that tool is a grinder. So there's a couple different types of grinders that I use here in my shop. I'm sure you've seen me use them on the channel. So let's talk about the grinder itself first. The grinder that I've done the majority of my grinding on during my welding career has probably been a DeWalt grinder. And I actually prefer the paddle on the bottom here, the trigger, the switch, whatever you want to call it. I actually prefer this setup. It's just the most ergonomic for me. That's not to say that a lot of these other brands don't make a fantastic grinder. I think Milwaukee makes a great grinder. I think Metabo makes a great grinder. Makita makes a good grinder. So there's a lot of different brands out there you can get. But this is just what I prefer. Obviously I've got the DeWalt battery grinder. Part of the reason is because that's just the type of battery tools I run here in my shop. It's not that I'm against the others or anything like that. I actually have quite a few other Milwaukee battery tools but right now my larger drills and stuff, they're all DeWalt. So that's why I opted for the DeWalt battery grinder. It has the same type of paddle on the bottom. I just, I really like this system. This battery grinder here is extremely useful if I'm doing a job like outside, if I take a couple batteries with me, it's usually got enough juice that I can do what I need to. If I know that I'm going to be doing something a little more serious, I will definitely take a cord and a grinder and I'll either run it off the welder or find a plug. But I like having the option of not having a cord as well as having the corded grinder. Obviously this grinder has way more power and it's got way more torque. And so if I've got to really do a down and dirty job with like a zip disc, where I'm cutting something and it's gonna take me quite a while I'm not gonna use this grinder for that because I don't feel like it's really built for that and it'll probably smoke the motor so usually I will just grab my corded grinder and I've had really good luck with these ones they take a lot of abuse and obviously if you smell it start heating up you want to back off or whatever but for the most part I've put these grinders through the ringer and they have held up tremendously. So that's the grinders, that's the actual tool. So now let's move on to talk about what kind of abrasives I use. And I use numerous types of abrasives. And a lot of it depends on what type of material I'm working on, what the scenario is. You've heard me talk on the channel before about not mixing abrasives on your grinder with different types of metal because you get cross-contamination. So that's one of the things you want to keep in mind. That's one of the reasons that I have to keep a good stock in my toolbox of all these different types of abrasives because I work with stainless, I work with aluminum, I work with mild, and so I can't cross-contaminate those things. And so you've got to have a little bit of a stock there so that you are able to do that. You don't want to end up running out and then say, oh, shoot, I'm out. Now I need to use a mild steel grinding wheel on a stainless steel part. 
So now if we roll into our abrasives, let's talk about those for a second. You guys know that I label all of my discs. This one here says aluminum, so this is an aluminum flap disc, and that's the only thing I use it for. If I have a stainless steel one, I mark SS on it, and I know it's a stainless steel flap disc. I just try to keep everything separate. I'll show you guys my abrasive drawer. It's not the greatest, it's not the most clean, it's not the most organized, but it works for me. All right guys, so here's my abrasives drawer. Obviously I've got brand new, these are the little Scotch-Brite attachments for my little Milwaukee die grinder. And I keep everything in line and in category with what type of material I can use this with. These are obviously all mild. I've got a mild hard disk here that I've used. I always know where I put them, so I know that what type of material I've used them with. The ones in the boxes are brand new. So I've got stainless wire wheels, carbon steel wire wheels. These boxes here are different grit. This is a 60 grit sandpaper disc for the grinder attachment. I keep little boxes like this for ones that are used. So these are all mild steel, but when, when they get worn down like this, I usually put them in here. And I'll use them for various things that they'll still work for. But if I need to do a really good job and I need enough reach, then obviously I get a new one. I do have some other abrasives in here for my die grinders and stuff like that. I got these flapper wheels, three different sizes. You never know what kind of hole size you're dealing with. I keep some scotch Brite in here. I'll polish stainless up with that. You can see I've got some aluminum discs here and you want to be careful with what type of discs you use with aluminum. You're only supposed to use a specific type of grinding wheel on aluminum so keep that in mind. I've got, got a brand new set of 7 inch cutoff wheels, 5 inch, so everything in the container is brand new. You can see I've got my used zip discs here. Sometimes these come in handy if you got to get into tight spot or something. So I usually keep a few of these smaller ones. Once they get way small, I chuck them. And then obviously I've got a little container here with some of these Scotch Brite pads that are used. And those are going to be for mild steel only. Anything stainless or anything like that, I put side and I label it so that's my abrasives drawer not super impressive but I do try to keep it as organized as possible and when I start getting low on something I will order usually when I get two or three left so so let's let's talk a little bit about the attachments we have here so first up we have our zip discs or cut off wheels whatever you want to call them and I carry two different sizes here in my shop. I carry a five inch and I carry a seven inch. And the seven inch, obviously those are for jobs where you have to have something with a larger diameter to squeeze into a corner or into a tight place and get something cut apart. Those are extremely handy. Okay, so those are our cutoff wheels. Okay, so the next one we wanna talk about is just our hard disc, just a regular grinding disc. And I use a four and a half with the arbor. I prefer the discs with arbors. If you look at what I have here, my flat discs have arbors on them, wire wheels, hard discs. The only thing that doesn't is cutoff wheel. I prefer the discs with the arbor on them. It's just, it's quicker. I'm able to spin them on and spin them off and you don't have issues with them slipping or anything like that. So that's just what I prefer, okay? I also use pearl flap discs. One of the reasons that I like the pearl flap discs is because they're extremely thick and they last a lot longer than some of these other companies. Some companies, if you look at their flap discs, they're extremely thin and you don't get as much life out of them. Abrasives are something that are really expensive and so being a business owner you got to keep track of how much you're spending and money coming in and money going out and so if you can save a little bit of money on your abrasives then I would say you should do it and this is one route that I have found you can save a little bit of money by buying a better abrasive 
that will last longer versus a cheaper abrasive that's not going to last you as long. So just a little bit of advice there. Okay, so that's the flap disc. Okay, so then we roll into our wire wheels. I've got two types of wire wheels here. This is just what I carry, but I carry, usually I use the Ferd brand, and I believe they're made in Germany. They hold up extremely well. I carry, t I carry two types of wire wheels, carbon steel and stainless, and obviously I only use those on that type of metal. If I do use a wire wheel on aluminum, I'll use a stainless wire wheel. And it's really neat because if you look on the wire wheel, it actually has labeled stainless or carbon steel. So you don't even have to mark these, it's already on there for you. If we roll into a little bit more of the specialized side of abrasives and the attachments that you can get for a grinder, you start looking at like a scotch bright attachment. This one here is pretty worn and this one does require a grinder nut but if you look it's just little pieces of like scotch bright and it's laid out like a flap disc but this right here for stainless and aluminum is an awesome tool if you're looking to clean it up and polish it up and I highly recommend if you do stainless and aluminum work you look into those another attachment that I have this here is like a hook and loop attachment so it works like velcro and you basically just got a scotch bright pad that attaches to this attachment and it's made by 3m and then it's got an arbor in it so i can just spin it on and off when i need to change the pad i just pull it off and slap a new one on you can get the blue the brown the red so you can get all the different grades of scotch bright for that as well and again, that is a game changer when you're working on stainless, aluminum, um, those types of metals. So that's typically what I use these for. Uh, the last one I'd like to talk about is just one that I, I haven't had this for very long, but I have used it on the last couple of handrail projects that I've had, and that is specifically what I bought this attachment for. So what you've got is you've got a little rubber it's like hard plastic or rubber attachment here that slides over the grinder and then you slap your sandpaper on there but you put those on and then you take your arbor nut here and then you screw it on the thing I really like about this attachment is when you're doing something like handrail where you want all your joints to be flat so where I have two legs that meet and then I weld it and I need to buff that completely flat on the sides like I do on my handrail. If you keep your, your grinder angle really flat and you use this attachment and you just run it back and forth, run a pass and check it, run a pass and check it, that is an excellent way to get a very flat finish. So anything you're trying to do where you have to buff your weld off or grind your weld off and you want it as flat as possible, I would look into getting the sandpaper attachment for your grinder. That's been, that's been a good tool to pick up for my grinder. There's a couple other attachments you can get for your grinder that I don't have here. And I actually do use them, but I think I've used them all up. Um, one being, and I would say this is one that you should look into, they make an actual stone. It's a stone that has the arbor nut in it, and you just spin the stone on, and it's they make various sizes, but most of the time, it's like a two inch stone and it's round and you screw that on and anytime you cut a round hole and you want to grind down in that hole and try to make it as perfectly round as possible it's just it's basically a hard disc but it's in a round shape it attaches to your grinder and you're able to ream that hole out and get it nice and smooth so that's one that I would mention another attachment that I would mention that I don't have here is it's a wire wheel but it's a cup wire wheel so it's the cup style. Those are really good if you're knocking rust off the surface. Like I said, there are multiple, multiple attachments you can get for a grinder. A grinder is something that's not super exciting when you think of fabrication tools. But for you guys just getting started, I would say that one of the very first things that you want to look into is a grinder. 
I would also say that the sooner that you get proficient at using a grinder and knowing how to use a grinder well and safely, you're going to be a better, a better welder. Because a huge part of fabrication is preparation, work preparation. And so if you take the time, if you take the time to go through and prepare your work and make it look nice and clean, get your bevels nice and pretty, the end product that you're left with after you run your welds is going to look better than if you were to just hurry up, slap it together and weld it up and then try to make it look the best you can with a grinder later. A grinder is just as important in preparation work as it is in cleanup, in my opinion. So, like I said, this is probably not the most exciting, super cool tool segment, but a grinder is extremely important and it's probably one of the tools that I use the most here in the shop. If you were to look at time spent with a tool, a grinder is definitely going to be up there. So, if you don't have a grinder, check them out. There's lots of different brands you can get. If we're looking at price point, obviously you've got anywhere from Harbor Freight clear up to Metabo, and that's basically your price range. And you're looking at anywhere from probably $50 clear up to $250 depending on size of grinder and stuff like that. And obviously there's other abrasives and stuff that I'll use if I'm using a big six inch grinder, but this is the most common grinder that I use in the shop. These are the most common sizes and so that's what we've decided to talk about today. So if you don't have a grinder I would start shopping for one. I would save your money and get a decent one. That would be my recommendation. This is one of those tools that as a welder you know you're gonna have to buy multiple grinders over the course of your career. They do have a lifespan on them but the better quality you buy the longer the lifespan. So I would keep that in mind. If you guys are interested in any of these abrasives that you see here, I pretty much get all my abrasives online. Um, Combat Abrasives sells some good ones. Empire Abrasives sells some good ones. That's pretty much going to wrap up our super cool tool segment on grinders and abrasives. I hope you guys saw something on here you can use. And I hope you guys will take the time in the future Make sure you do good prep work and make sure you do good cleanup. Make yourself a better welder. Let's get back to the project. All right, what's going on guys? We're back out here tonight. It's been a couple days since we've got on this project again. I actually was completely out of wire and just about completely out of gas. So I ended up going to the welding store today. I got four bottles of gas filled. Two rolls of wire, some wire wheels, and it was a thousand dollars. So anybody who thinks that it's not expensive to run a welding business, it is. Anyway, tonight we are going to try to get this finished up. So all I've got left to do here is I'm going to clean the welds up on this tube and then I've got to make sure that I get these little feet mounted in the right direction but i'm going to get the welds cleaned up on them i'm going to get them put back in the right place then i should be ready to stitch weld it back on i am going to go a little bit smaller stitch on these this time i'll probably space them out about the same but i am going to go less weld on the ends i won't go solid on that inside end that's the plan we're going to go to that point so going to do some cleanup real quick and start getting it all laid out we'll go to that point Okay, so we got this all cleaned up. We got our fork pockets all cleaned up. I got a sharp soapstone here and my tape 
and I'm going to go ahead and lay this out. They asked for 19 inches on center. So I take a measurement of the full width of the plate, which is 36 inches. We know we're 19 inches on center, so that's 17 inches. And then we take that and divide it by 2, so that's 8 and a half inches. That should give us our 19, which it does. And then we've got to remember these are six. If we bump out three inches from our marks, that'll give us an outside measurement. We will be able to mark our crow's foot on either end. Then we'll be able to draw a line and we'll have our marks so that we can get these nice and square and mounted right where we need to. So I'm going to go three inches off my mark. Okay. All right, we're going to do the same thing on that end. So we got a mark on either end. We'll get these set up here, and then we'll go ahead and tack them on. A lot of times, projects like this, where you're performing surgery basically to cut a piece apart you don't want to damage the structure and then you want to clean it up you got to re-weld it together and you need to keep everything flat and straight a lot of projects like this are extremely difficult in my mind a lot of projects like this are typically more time consuming. Any sort of modification is typically gonna take more time, in my opinion, than, than just building a new one. And then after we get these welded back on, we gotta flip it back over and reassemble it. As fun as the disassembly was, I'm afraid the assembly's gonna be even worse. Okay, that's right where those need to go. So I'm gonna clamp those down and get them tacked down. And I am gonna double check one more time. Okay, that's exactly 19 on center. Hopefully they're happy with that. I'm gonna clamp it down and get it tacked. All right guys, quick update. I got these all tacked on, and then I realized there's some holes here that the pockets would have interfered with to mount the rollers. I texted the customer, Asked them if I could bump them out a half an inch. So they're 20 on center right now. And they were good with it. So we've moved our marks a half inch on either side. So they are now an inch wider. We've got them tacked down. And now I'm just laying out the stitch pattern. these down because they're not quite tight on the table. I'm gonna build I'm gonna build me a dog here.
so for you guys who haven't seen me use a dog in a wedge, what you do is you basically just make an L piece shape. It's called your dog. We're going to go ahead and tack this on. So you actually want to drive your wedge the same side as your tack or your weld. Okay. So that sucked it up tight. So now I'm going to go ahead and bounce around, tack it up, and then I'll tack that other side. Okay, and then when you're done, just break the dog off, clean that up with a grinder. We're going to do the same thing here. If you've really got to pull something, obviously you're going to put a pretty good size weld there, but this, this is going to work good enough with just a small tack, and then I only have to clean up a small tack. Okay, so we're good. So now it's nice and tight. We'll get it tacked on. Okay. Good little trick to know. Obviously you could use a half clamp here as well. I don't have a half clamp because I typically don't like to cut my clamps in half. Um, I think you can purchase something like that. But you can use a half clamp where you tack the clamp on the base material and then you screw the clamp down and it'll do the same thing. But for what I'm doing here this, this worked just fine. Okay, so now all that's left to do is to weld it out. those all welded out, cleaned up. We knocked the spatter off, knocked all our slag off. I'll give you guys a look and then we will go ahead and flip it over and I'm going to see if I can't get the rollers put back on. I'm hoping they go back together a little easier than they came apart. But I got a feeling that's not the case. 
Okay, so you can see I went a lot smaller stitch. They're a little bit bigger than an inch. There's five tacks on each side. The ends are about a three inch stitch. So, it's gonna be plenty to hold that on there. I did use dual shield. So, I'll bet I can, I'll bet I can touch this. Yeah, it's just barely warm. So, hopefully it uh, warped a lot less this time than the last time. So, I'm gonna flip it over now and see if I can't get the rollers mounted. Okay guys, we got it all done. Somewhere in the middle of all this, the camera battery died, so I don't know how much of the time lapse you saw. But what I can tell you is, that was quite a task. Um, I did take a level, and this is pretty much perfectly flat. I did have to shim it up with the washers like they did. Um, you can see that the plate is a little tweaked on this end because the fork pockets end somewhere right here and so between the heat and the weight that's been tweaked just a little bit so that's why there's more of a gap there's like three washers here two washers here and two washers here because it's also tweaked a little bit this way because of the heat from the weld so on the outside there's two washers and then it's flush on the center but it is done the assembly and the disassembly was obviously the worst part but this is what they wanted they wanted it flush with the outside of the rollers so we were able to disassemble it cut the outside down move the fork pockets in they are now at 20 inches so this one is done um, one other thing I did want to say we're at like 630 subscribers which I want to thank you guys for subscribing watching liking commenting all of those good things I do want to do a giveaway I don't know a whole lot about all this giveaway stuff and how it all works so I've got to figure it out but I do want to do a giveaway when I hit a thousand subscribers so I'm gonna do some research on that I'm sure a lot of you are laughing but I'm figuring this whole social media thing out so I want to do a giveaway it's not gonna be anything huge but at this point it's just gonna be probably like hat sticker that sort of thing so like subscribe share we appreciate you guys watching and we'll see you on the next one
intact or I'm gonna go ahead and what am I gonna go ahead and do? So that's the grinders that's the grinders and then you've got a little and then you've got a little <clears throat>